Um, I'm really honored to be here. This is, um, first of all, this is a wonderful chance for me to welcome Dr. Michael Walker to campus here at Brown University. Um, we have been studying your book in my class on mass incarceration. There are also folks here from the John Hay Library because we've been building an archive on mass incarceration. There are activists, um, there are undergraduates, graduate students, people still filing in. So we are just so happy to be hosting you, Michael. Um, and so uh, just a quick introduction. Um, Professor Michael Walker received his BA in economics from the University of California, Riverside. We won't judge the economics piece of that, but okay. Um, where he completed his PhD in sociology. Good job, there we go, in 2014. Um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Walker's broad interests include social control, stratification, inequality, um, which he pursues through studying of criminal justice generally and jails specifically. Um, he plans to continue examining jails as a social laboratory where mental health and his more general interests intersect. He's an award-winning author and scholar, and we're just so honored to have you here. The format of this will be um, Dr. Walker's going to present for a little while on his research and give us some um, insight into his amazing book called Indefinite. And then we're going to end um, doing some Q&A at the table here and then, of course, bringing the audience into it. So thank you so much. All right, so thank you. I just want to say for all of you who are sitting two, three rows back, I can still see you. So you could have sat here, it would have been just fine. You're not, you're not hidden. So I want to begin with this. This is sort of an approximation. There was a time when me and my celly, uh, at the time I called him Scott in the book, and it was about I don't know, maybe 2.30 in the morning and he woke up in our cell. The cells were always extremely cold, but he was sweating. And he woke up and the first thing he said to me, he's like, man, I was going through it last night. And I knew sort of intuitively what he meant to be going through it last night. At that point, you know, breakfast was going to be served in about an hour and a half, two hours. And so I, I hadn't slept at all and I just didn't see any reason at all to, to go to sleep. And he just kind of murmurs to himself as he's hopping off the top bunk and he says, man, this makes me not even want to go to sleep. Now at the time, um, if you go back maybe a year before then, I was in graduate school and I am a first generation college grad and decided to go all the way. Um, and there was a point in which I had sort of de developed a depression that I really thought I was too black, too tall, and sort of too masculine to even really have. I didn't know any black people who had depression. Um, I thought I was just sad and broke, and I just thought if I had more money, I would be better off and that things would be okay. Um, but I really wasn't doing a very good job of balancing depression and academic work. Somehow I had gotten through a year of graduate school and I had been able to sort of be successful. But at the start of that graduate program, I had been arrested. And I thought, I remember being in the back of a police cruiser and saying to myself, I'm in my late 20s, statistically, it's too late for me being arrested for the first time. I should be all right. I shouldn't be dealing with this. Um, but I, there I was. And I had a professor who told me, who I confided in, he said, you know, you got to write about it. And I didn't really want to do that. It really wasn't what I was interested in, but I wrote about it nonetheless, and I thought it was going to be a one-off. Finish that year of graduate school, get arrested twice more at the, at the start of the second year. It seemed like a, a cycle now. And now at this point, I'm just going to court almost as often as I go to class. So every seminar, I, I go to a seminar, and I go to court once or twice a week. And that's kind of all I was doing. If you've never been to a criminal court, um, it is one of the most debilitating experiences that you can have. You understand that your life is in the balance even if it's a small amount of time that you're going to be off, whatever small is to us. Um, and I remember thinking, I can't maintain both of these. And so at some point, um, I did start listening to a, I had a friend, uh, Dr. Edna Bonasich, who's now retired, who um, was a professor in the department when I was in graduate school. But she told me, she's like, you know, you need to, you know, take care of yourself. You need to sort of put yourself first. And it took a lot, she had to say this, say this to me a bunch of times before I started to sort of heed what she was suggesting. But at some point I did go into therapy. I did start you know, getting some type of help and I got my depression mildly under control. And there was a day that because I had been arrested on the college campus, that then sparked an investigation from the, from, uh, the university. So aside from the criminal court case, it also uh, sparked another investigation through the housing authority because I was in front of my, my apartment. And so all these different parts of the institutions are sort of working against me in this moment. 
And I had a scheduled appointment with Judicial Affairs on uh, February 7th, 2008, that was my birthday. And I decided I was gonna sow a good seed in the universe and just go down to the courthouse and pay some traffic fines. I figured if I did that, you know, it's like, well, I've done something good today. Then I'll go to my meeting with, with Judicial Affairs and that'll work out. But a warrant had been re reissued and changed. And so all I had done was present myself to the courthouse to be arrested. So I got arrested that day. And in the end, um, I ended up having to sort of subject myself to um, 100 and I was, I should say the first thing that my, uh, my public defender said to me was, you know, they're trying to give you three years. And at this point I had been going to court. I was a single father. I had to figure out what I was gonna do with my son. Um, you know, his mother was sort of in the wind and I needed to think about what I was gonna do with my career and I wasn't able to balance it all. I just kind of gave up. Like this was too much to go down to the courthouse on your birthday and think and not be expected to get arrested and then to be arrested. When I came home, I had three letters, one from the IRS. I had an ongoing fight with the Department of Child Support Services trying to, I was still paying child support to a mother who was gone um, while raising my son. I had an eviction notice from the university and then I had an, a letter saying that I had been expelled also. So I was no longer a graduate student, I was just Michael. And now, so when they tell me you're offering you three years, I just said, forget it, give it to me. And it, I guess my public defender was shocked. So he's like, hold on, hold on, let me go see if I can get some, you know, reduce this. He comes back, he's like, 240 days. I was like, give it to me. He's like, oh, hold on, let me, let me, let me try again. He comes back, 180 days. 180 days of which you have to do 120 straight. So I did the 120 days straight, but if you add all the time that I, done, that I did together, it was about 134 days in jail in a room that looks just like this. Initially, when I went to jail, I thought I was gonna get out in about three days because almost everybody was told they were gonna be out in about three days in this particular county in Southern California. Every public defender generally said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, you got a nonviolent charge or don't worry about it, the jail's overcrowded. They'll make room for people who have violent charges and you'll be out in three days. And I first was telling other people that, I ain't gonna be here for long, about three days, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Three days come and go, I'm still there. A week comes and goes, and now I'm actually the butt of jokes. People laughing at me because I keep saying I'm getting out in three days. I remember one guy saying, yeah, I was told that about four years ago. I'm still here, right? I didn't know, by the way, that you can be in jail for four years, six years, nine years, not yet having your case adjudicated, the innocent until proven guilty, but punished just the same. I didn't know that that was a thing. No one had told me that this was a possibility. But after a certain period of time, about a week or so, I realized I'm not going anywhere. So I started taking notes. This was just my natural inclination to write about what I saw and what I was experiencing. It was not me trying to be a maverick sociologist. And at first I just started writing about how much I hated myself. I had packed my house up, I surrendered myself to jail, which is a different type of experience. I had packed my house up, I had packed my son up, I had enrolled him in school with my mother, which is a, <laughs> a, a, a not an easy task to, to, to go through. And, and I thought about, I wrote about what it meant to have done that. But the night before I submitted, surrendered myself, one of the professors in the department who eventually became my dissertation chair told me, pay attention to what you see. And while I was angry with her because I didn't know her, I was like, why are you calling me? Who gave you my cell phone number? And why are you telling me to pay attention to what I see? Like, is this gonna be some kind of exploitive project for you? But I did pay attention to what I saw. Um, if you go, if you're one of these people who's like me, who will go to some, a bar or a restaurant and, and will people watch and create a whole storyline about the people you see who are there, you too are a natural sociologist, whether you know that or not. And I followed that impulse and I started taking a second set of field notes. These actually become field notes. At first it was just writing for the sake of writing and with a little while it became writing because I needed to con have a place to exercise my personal demons and I needed to, I started paying attention analytically to what I saw, what I thought was interesting. In the end, I get back into grad school, All right? This is skipping a whole bunch of stuff, but I get back into grad school. Welcomed back, in fact, by, by the faculty, uh, which is a reminder to have done, that I had done enough work to have sowed a good seed. I finished my dissertation. That dissertation becomes this book. I wanna give you a brief subject about this book before we sit down and have our conversation um, as a way of sort of illustrating the way that I do sociology in general, but also um, as a way of sort of giving you some sense of what it means to be there. Now, there is no such thing, strictly speaking, as a sociology of dreams, but early into my time there, I started paying attention to what I was dreaming, not because I thought it was gonna be relevant. You have to remember, I was not at graduate school anymore. People fell out of graduate school for all kinds of reasons, least of which being jail time. So I did not think I was gonna go back to graduate school. I didn't imagine myself as Professor Walker. 
Instead, I was just writing because what the hell else was I going to do? It's like doing push-ups. You're not working out for any particular goal. It's just what you do. So this is just what I did. But in writing what I saw, I started to pay attention to the themes. There's this one particular dream that I had in which it was my, you know, I was my grown self, but I was in my teenage house with my mother, and she was getting ready to go play bingo. And she was searching around the house for her bingo dots, and she was yelling at me about needing the bingo dots, something that actually had happened many times before. And I was there with my son, and I was explaining to her, you need to stay because something bad is going to happen. And I didn't know what it was that was going to happen, but I just perceived that something bad was going to happen. So then I sort of am, you know how dreams work. You're like in one scene, actually, you know, you're just in this other scene, right? And I'm in this other scene, and I'm holding my son, and he's dead, and he's in some water. And I don't know if it's, you know, is it a bathtub? Is it a pool? Like, where are we? And then the scene switches again. I'm, I'm, I'm holding my son, and I'm in the street, and I'm crying that now he has passed. And what wakes me ultimately is my tears streaming down my, my cheeks as I'm in my, my, my cold cell. Now, before this, and I, actually since then, I've never had dreams like this. I have not had dreams like that since, uh, since my time in jail. And what I started to pay attention to was that, okay, so I'm having particular kinds of dreams while I'm here. And my dreams are starting to, I could go back and I could code them. I started to feel all of the distillation, distil, <laughs> Uh, all of the content, so I can get rid of the word distill, I can't even say it now, I probably should drink some water, <laughs> distill, but add the word, uh, anyway, it doesn't even matter. So it's, obviously I don't have that word like I thought I did. It's, it's out there somewhere, but it's not for me. But the content of my dreams, which is the more the easier word to use, um, sort of can be coded along these types of themes. And so always it was, I was like either being chased by mental health workers, or I was being chased by police officers, or something terrible was happening to my son, and I was never right there. It was always just, just too late to get there, right? I was just too late to save him, or I was just too late to do something that I needed to do for him. Or I was being harmed in some way, or I was in some kind of weird um, revenge quest to go, you know, to get somebody who had harmed me or my family in some regards. I had not been having these kinds of very visceral, very violent, and very scary dreams before I had ever been to jail. And as I said, not since then. But I soon figured, well, if I'm the one having these dreams, I'm not special here. It can't just be me. So I go to what we would call church. Church is one of the few places where everybody from all different racial and ethnic groups can sit and interact. It's just a, a program room, an empty space. That's all it is, but we just called it church. And you start to get stories from other people talking about the nightmares that they're having. One guy saying, I had this nightmare where I'm being pinned against a wall and there are dogs barking at me and serpents striking at me. And slowly you start to hear other people say, man, I had that dream. I have that nightmare too. I have something similar to that. Well, what I realized is, okay, this isn't just me. There's something special about the context of being here, the organizational culture, the experiences here that are shaping all of our dreams and our nightmares. Even something as intimate as what I'm dreaming doesn't belong specifically to me. It is much more profoundly sociological than I had thought. I'm realizing that the more, if we had something like a, a study of the sociology of dreams, we'll find that the more cloistered the organization, right, the more homogenous the popula population, because everyone's subjected to a similar kind of conditions, you will, the more you'll find that people's dreams tend to coalesce around certain types of themes. It doesn't mean that they'll be exactly the same, but you'll find that the sort of the intensity and the frequency with which they have these dreams will sort of change, right? So in jail, they look like this, but in other places, they will look a little bit different. But this is some, kind of the unique aspect of what's happening to you when you're in jail. So I decided I was gonna do something about it. I'm having a conversation at one point with one of my cellies, and he decides he's gonna go to a mental health uh, check. He goes to mental health, they give him something, whatever it is. I had had one other celly go to mental health, and whatever they gave him didn't do anything. He still, his sleep was awful all the time. This particular celly, Scott, when he went, he slept better, but then he stopped having dreams altogether. And it was a little bit like going to get that general anesthesia. Like he just woke up and had no sense of where he was and what time it was. And he found this, you know, profoundly distressing. He's like, I'm not dreaming. Now, I thought that I had seen but prior to jail time that I had seen somewhere that we always dream no matter what, whether you can remember it or not. So I argued as if I was right. I was like, no, man, you, you just don't know, you know, you're having the dreams, you just don't remember them. And he argued back, no, I'm not dreaming at all. And it's a problem. Like I, I going to sleep and don't feel rested. I don't feel anything. Another gentleman, um, while we're having this conversation, he chimes in and he says, well, I don't know about 
you know, not having any sleep. But he's like, I'm at the point where I'm so well rested and have so little things going on in my life that I'm just having the same ideas. I'm running out of ideas. I'm running out of ideas to even sleep about, you know, to, to, to dream about. Sort of what we might call like a deprivation dream, like a deprivation of, of just new information. There's another kind of sort of issue here that I was having that I noticed too, not just among me, but others. Normally right now when I'm writing something, if I go to sleep about it, my mind will sort of noodle it a little bit. And when I wake up, I'll have something, maybe the next line that I'll use in the paragraph to get me to the next step. I wasn't having any kind of productive sleep like that. I wasn't having any kind of erotic dreams. I don't know what everybody else was having, but I certainly wasn't having any more erotic dreams. So you get these weird, you know, changes in, the, in your sleep patterns and your sleep hygiene. It's not just the dreams, but it's also the environment. This is an incredibly cold place. I remember my uh, telling my cellie man, I just can't get comfortable and having him tell me, just don't, you're not supposed to be comfortable here. But note that this is a metal bunk and the mattress that you're sleeping on is foam. It's about two and a half, three inches thick. So when you turn over, that's your elbow, boom, right on the metal. So you see people wake up and in the mornings in the breakfast time at 4.30 a.m. is when they serve breakfast, breakfast at 4.30 a.m lunch around 10.30 uh, uh, a.m., and then dinner at 4.30 p.m. So you have this 12-hour forced fasting period, you know, this intermittent fasting that you have to do while you're there. And so it changes literally the circadian rhythms with which you normally organize yourself. You also have no access to natural sunlight. It, you could conceivably go months without ever seeing the sun or only having some change in lighting based upon the fact that you went to court because the courts are connected to the jail underground, so you never need to go outside and you don't get rec time on a regular basis. And much like this place, uh, this jail is actually a little more decked out than the cell that I was in, because this one looks like you have a, like a coat rack or something. I have no idea what that's supposed to be. I didn't have anything like that. And I didn't have shelves for sure. Like that, you know, that's almost nice, um, comparatively speaking. But you get the jail environment itself is a difficult place to sleep. Sleep hygiene is one of those things that we don't oftentimes discuss with jails, but it's not just the cell. So that, on the left-hand side, you get this two-man cell, like what I call closed day rooms. On the right-hand side, you have the three, the three high bunks, which is no easier to sleep on. If you, are, if you come from a, a, a raising a black family, you know what it means to go outside and be told, either going to be out or you're going to be in. If you sleep on the middle bunk, you're either going to be in your bunk or you're not. If you're going to be the top bunk, either be up there or not. But you can't keep climbing up and down. You've got to decide where you're going to be. In the, 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 the two-man cell, the lights in the cells never go off, not under any circumstances. And it's this kind of institutional lighting that you get when you go into hospitals or prisons or jails or whatever else, right? The kind of light that's always peering into your mind. In the other cell, nothing has changed in terms of the, the level of security, but in that, the lights are, go off at 10 p.m., they cut back on at 4.30 a.m., and then they, don't, they stay on all day long, right, for the rest of your time while you're there. These things profoundly disrupt the nature of sleep while you're there. Here are some of the things that you can experience um, independently if you have poor sleep hygiene. I should note that suicide is the number one cause of death in American jails, followed by heart disease. We have this, the jail as its own independent factor to a new type of stratification of just sleep hygiene itself. It's worth remembering that people who are in jail tend to be people who are poor, relatively disenfranchised, or if nothing else, disempowered or marginalized. So I want us to rethink the jail as a, as a place where it's not just who's going in and who's going out, not just your economic fallout and all those things, but literally some place that will actually kill you. Not just slowly, but also quickly. So I'm gonna leave it there. There's much more to be said here, but I'm gonna leave it here so we can have a conversation. I just wanted to introduce this as one of those things that those aspects of what it means to be incarcerated that oftentimes fly under the radar, right? It's something that we don't think about, but it's something I would not have thought about had I not been there. But then when you're there, you realize just how profound um, the problems with sleep hygiene really are. All right, I'll take a, take a break for there. That water is cold, let's see if this one is too. So I forgot to give a shout out and a big thank you to the Center for Slavery and Justice that is making all of this possible. We have a mass incarceration cluster um, that is both research-based, but also student-based, activist-based. And so we are just so grateful that they could help convene us here today. Um, so thank you so much. I, you know, I feel astounded by the opening of the book because one of the things that we always talk about in class or just in general 
is this criminological understanding of mental health in America, which we say the largest provider of mental health services to the poor is the Cook County Jail mm -hmm. and the LA County Jail. And then we open up on this book where you are basically in the tiny cell that the conditions would almost induce a mental health disaster to anybody. Right. So talk to me about what criminologists specifically are missing and maybe even journalists that are perpetuating this idea that mental health is being distributed at jails. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them and, and how did you find out about it the hard way, so to speak? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly found out the hard way. So there's, there's a, I don't know if this is on, if you can hear, but can you hear me clearly? Okay, there you yeah. go. So there's a difference between saying jails are the largest providers of mental health. What we're saying, what we really mean is that we have deinstitutionalized mental health in, in this nation, which we did in the 60s. And so where else do you get any kind of mental health just in general? But it's not treatment, right? To say that there is a provider sort of there is not the same as saying you're actually going to get help while you're there. You have to remember that jails only do one thing. They just break things. That's, that's what they do. Right, by function. So you're not gonna go there to get fixed. You're not gonna get treatment while you're there. They don't even have the resources to do it. It's not functionally, deter you know, sort of created to do that as, as to play that role in society. What I found out um, very quickly is that what mental health looks like oftentimes could be just mean getting thrown into a suicide cell or a safety cell. It could mean um, just having a, a conversation with a nurse and not getting anything else. It could mean being told by the psychiatrist that you should just go back and deal with it. Have a have a heart to heart or logical conversation with people who are trying to kill you. Go have a heart to heart conversation with people who are under similar stress and also trying to beat you up, not for any particular thing that you've done. Um, and these types of situations, you, you, treatment is like you know a foregone. You're not getting that, right? You're not getting that. What you're getting, not even stopgap treatment, where you can say, "Oh, I got at least something here." What you're getting is just a time out of your cell. And if you can call that treatment. I guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you go visit a mental health worker while you're in jail, you get time out of your cell. But, you know, it's, it's not actual any kind of support you're going to get. I remember at the time when I went in, I entered um, having been treated for depression. When I go in, there's no pickup, there's no continuation of that. When I, when I go to mental health and I, and I took all those trips in part because it's an opportunity to get more data, but also because it was an opportunity for me to get out of the cell and I would do anything almost to get out of the cell. Um, as much as I would go there and talk to, to the person who I called Dr. Cross and another nurse, Nurse B, whatever the, the services I got there, there's no continuation off afterwards. When I was thrown into a suicide cell, there was no, no follow-up to see like, well, how did I respond to that? Well, you know, what happened to you? So you know, there's no such thing as treatment really in a, in a jail. You can yeah. just forget that. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about, uh, a dramaturgical model of sociology, which is mm. this idea that we have these identities that we present um, to the world, to each other. And I think, you know, there's a really poignant time about where you talk about the taking of clothes mm. and what that means. And can you talk a little bit about how that identity was for you, that journey? Because on the one hand, here you were, you were a father, you had, you were a grad student, you know, you had all these different, you know, a son, and then there is this transformative process, you know, I think we've read John Irwin's The Jail mm. and about that kind of surrendering of self. And it's associated with just pure degradation, but there's something about you and how you write about that that shows that you had a level of resistance to it. So mm. talk to us a little bit about that process for you. So the first thing that pops in my mind is, so my mom did 22 years in the Army uh, before retiring, and there's two things that she would take off when she would come home from the Army, from her, her shift. At the, you know, she might have been in doing field exercise or whatever else. She would yell at me to take off her boots, and then she would take off her bra. And that was her way of saying, I'm done for the day, right? I've taken <laughs> off that identity. Now I'm just going to be mom. And, you know, our clothes become, as Goffman says, our identity kit. It's a way of understanding who we are. You know, they really do, they really are a reflection of who we are. The process, though, of going from having whatever your street clothes are to instead being assigned a number, being given a wristband that's put on tight enough where you can't really get it off, to, um, to being, you know, becoming just wearing the, the county oranges. The county oranges start to speak for you, right? The uniform speaks for you. I don't know every single police officer, I see the uniform. The uniform gives me an interpretation of who the person is based upon how I understand the uniform. The uniform in jail says guilty, says criminal. Doesn't say, 
hey, 72% or 60, depending upon what year you're looking at, anywhere between high 60s, low 70% of the people who are in jail haven't yet been found guilty. It doesn't say that, and everybody's together. It just says, you did this. As one deputy said to me, if you've been arrested, you definitely did something. So it's a weird assumption that they never get anything wrong, of course, right? Because how, how could the criminal justice system ever do anything wrong? But that stripping of the identity is methodical. The fingerprinting, you can't unlive it when you're experiencing it. The main thing that you, there's this weird emotional break from how you understand yourself. I remember feeling as if, like, I remember being very aware of it before I had read about it, before I knew that Goffman had written asylums, I had a, a word, a, a phrase for it. I remember thinking like, so it's like I'm sort of dying off in this process here. Mm -hmm. Not in a way that I would say, uh, more, more so symbolically, right? right. Um, and I knew also that once I was wearing those county oranges, I was gonna be treated differently. Mm -hmm. um, I went through great lengths at different times to try to have a conversation with deputies or other people when I started sort of conducting a study there. Um, and I found that oftentimes what would be in the way is my hair, because I'm a germaphobe and I refused to cut my, use the clippers that were in there that everybody else was using. And so I looked wild as hell in there for sure. And my size and the county oranges, right? That uniform speaks for me. My wristband speaks for me. Mm -hmm. So figuring out ways to overcome that was not an easy thing, mm -hmm. but that identity loss is, is sort of, you know, part and parcel for what it means to be incarcerated. Yeah. So I think, you know, some folks talk about ethnography, you know, just being embodied in, in the site that you're mm -hmm. in, you know, kind of becoming part of the culture. There's something really heroic about how this all went down, meaning, I mean, I could almost imagine you with like a little notepad, and I can <laughs> imagine you writing letters to your advisor. <laughs> Did, I mean, talk a little bit about, like, did you feel a sense of fear that the, like, COs would see you doing this and that that would cause you punishment? Like, talk a little bit about it. Or was it a sense of respite in this place where um, I think, you know, sometimes I call it compulsory idleness. Like, mm. this, like the idleness in jail is meant to punish you. Mm. Like, where you're just totally devoid of reading or, you know, right. stim mental stimulation. Like, what was this research for you? Well, let me first say, it wasn't heroic. <laughs> I didn't think of myself as a hero. I didn't think of myself as some kind of like super special maverick scholar or something, doing something unique. I didn't think I was going back to grad school. I thought my life was over with. So, you know, I had earned a BA and I thought maybe I'll be able to turn that into a job later on. What will I do? You can almost do nothing with a BA in economics. So I was like, what am I actually gonna do with this? <laughs> so, and I, did, and I thought now with a record and being in, I just could not imagine what my life was going to look like afterwards. And to be honest with you, I kind of thought I was never going to get out. Even though, even though I had a release date, I didn't think I was going to make it out. Mm -hmm. um, you end up living sort of every single moment. When I start writing, I do at first think, all right, at some point the deputy's going to come in here and take this stuff from me. They do the cell tosses on Sundays, and I thought they're going to toss my cell and they're going to take all this crap from me. Um, so I would write and I would send letters home to different professors trying to, especially as once I started establishing for myself that I was doing some kind of study. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that the study was gonna become anything, by the way. It is sort of a response to idleness, or what I would call like the vacuity of life. There's literally nothing at all to be done. But I didn't think that it was, I didn't, I didn't expect to be here. Like, this is the last thing I sort of, I didn't dream this, right? I just was writing because what else was I supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. um, but I found that when I told other, other um, what I call penal residents who were in there with me, that I was writing, mm -hmm. they weren't like, oh, yo, what are you writing about this for? Or, you know, be careful what you say. It was like, yo, I could write a book about this too. Mm -hmm. I could write about the color on the, you know, the paint on the walls that they choose here. I could write about this and whatever. So, you know, they they became they were very like open with like support. That said, I didn't walk around with a with a notepad and a pen, <laughs> like, yo, tell me what you think about this. That, that's not the way this was. I'm there, and in, as much as they were like willing to listen to me say, yeah, I wrote this book. I'm trying to write write about this. I couldn't say this is going to turn, a, turn into a book, and it wasn't. It, I didn't think of it even as a study, even as I was doing it that way. Right. It didn't occur to me that this is what this was going to be until it was done, yeah. right? And you, you're having conversations with people you're incarcerated with. It's a conversation. It's not an interview, mm -hmm. and you don't want to develop a reputation for walking around and asking people hella personal questions about their, themselves. Right. So everything had to be this kind of conversational type of thing, a way of getting at what I'm, I'm interested in. Um, yeah, I don't know that. I don't. I think if I had gone in there thinking I'm gonna do a study, it probably would have come out all wrong. I'm, I'm almost yeah. sure of it. Um, Did you feel like it was an act of resistance, though, to you know, in terms of, or even a, like a coping mechanism? Like, how mm -hmm. did you think about it? Is, I mean, you 
talked a little bit about the devoid of dreams and all these things, but what role then did the note taking help you in the in the passing of time, if you will? Well, at least the personal set of field notes, I hated myself. Yeah. So I don't know how, you know, I had a dream that I was gonna be somebody. And I think about my family, there's a lot of smart people in my family. And I remember asking my mother, like, you know, how come no one else has gone to college? Like, not nobody. Mm -hmm. No no one, no one else in my family has gone to college? Nobody. Like, that's crazy to me. Why is it, why am I the first one to go do this? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, there's a lot writing on this. I've got, I gotta do this and I gotta be successful in this. Um, so I, when I get in, I have to write about how awful I feel that I failed. I wrote a lot about how much people that I thought had sowed a good seed in my life and I had failed them. Mm -hmm. So what I felt more than anything else was shame. So I, I wrote just as a way of exercising my own demons. Mm -hmm. The idea of turning an analytical eye to something, I can't even tell you that this was like, I had had a methods, methods class in my first year of grad school, but I was not thinking this is gonna be a study. Right. I wasn't writing from the position of resistance. I wasn't fighting against the institution. I wasn't doing any of that. I was just trying to get through my jail time. And you know, some people pay attention to, um, some people write, write family members, some people build dice. It's all kind of, you know, ridiculously innovative things that people can do while you're in jail. Mm -hmm. I wrote, mm -hmm. it's just my outlet. Um, I think if I hadn't had a year of grad school under my belt, if I had been a different person, I would have done things differently. Many people did. Mm -hmm. Some people learned to draw. Um, mm -hmm. Some people wrote poetry. Um, I didn't do any of those things, so. So I think there's a moment in the book where I, I think I, you know, I was just saying that um, you talk a little bit about racial tropes. You mm. talk about the notion of the, and I think you even have it as one, but one big word, like the criminal black man, yeah. right? <laughs> this idea that we have, the mythology. Mm. And then you also talk directly to that CEO that's basically like, you have credit, you have, you know? Yeah. So he's, he's in some ways reciting that script right back at you. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about you know, how was it to continue to interview these CEOs that were in some ways putting a mirror up and saying, this is how we see you, and you have to be the so-called objective researcher in that kind of deplorable exchange. Hmm. Well, how did you deal with that? Objective is kind of a, a stretch as a term, right? I definitely had a feeling, and at, at this point, I had developed the, the, the field that sort of, they became actual field notes, and what I was doing was I was writing about how I felt about people in my personal set of field notes, so how I felt about people and myself, and then writing what I thought which is analytically interesting and useful to, not, right. to understand in the separate set of field notes. And when something seemed like it fit in both, which happened a lot, I just wrote it, I just wrote it both times. Mm -hmm. In jail, you can do that. I don't know if that's something that would suggest in everyday, you know, <laughs> ethnographic methods, um, but I could do that there. So when I have this interaction with this deputy, um, the first thing that I recognized was that there's a set of things that, that you have to do if you want to have a conversation with a deputy and you're incarcerated. So you can't just walk up and be like, yo, Dep, you know, tell me about, you know, you know, can I holler at you for a second? I'm not going to talk to you. So I learned that I need to not have more than two or three other people around me. Mm -hmm. More than that, they're not going to talk to me at all. I needed to ask them about themselves. Most people, in fact, can't wait to talk about themselves, mm -hmm. despite what they say. They want to talk about themselves for sure and deputies were no different. And then I asked questions that were innocuous. What made you become a deputy? That was it, that was my introduction. They would have a conversation. And then I, I understood that, yeah, I don't like this person, but it's not, I don't, there's a whole lot of people I don't like. There's people in my department I don't, I don't too much like that much, right? Don't they will never know, I won't tell them, and you won't either. <laughs> right? Promise. Because my because it's not up, to, I don't have to like you in order to, but to be right. cordial. So. I didn't think of my, I didn't feel like I needed to be yelling at people or, or fighting or, I wasn't, it, I wasn't some type of crusade in that regard. I just wanted to understand people from their own perspective. Right. That's it. And it, that kind of, that position, I think, yielded much more data, much more in, interesting responses than if I came at them like, yo, why the hell you treat us like this? Right. Or, you know, why you, why you call me this? Or why you talk to me, why do you talk to me the way you do? Um, flexing and being, like, imposing my size on somebody is not a good way to get them to respond to right. me. So instead, I would learn to sort of try to make myself smaller and have a conversation. And I didn't feel any kind of way about that. There was no like difficult emotional content to, I just understood that largely I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel, you know, stressed about trying to have a conversation with them about, even, even if they, no matter what they call me, right? right? They don't actually know me, so. And what about the code switching part of it? Because I'm <laughs> imagining like, 
you talk about, you know, being able to speak like a graduate student, you mm -hmm. can use the words in a particular context, and then conversing with other people, you might change the way you spoke, maybe the, your mannerisms. So tell right. me, how did you manage those identities without, I don't know, getting into trouble within the social system itself, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, well, everyone speaks to the deputies, so that ain't yeah. anything, you know, you're not, you're not unique. If, you know, I'm not, I wasn't doing anything outside of the, the norm to be having conversations with deputies. Um, what was different was I needed to interrupt the script that they had written about me. So when you want to sound as, when you, when you want to sound smart to somebody who's not in academia, you don't have to say a whole lot of you don't have to say like stratification or some. You could just say process, yeah. like that word alone yeah. signals to some people. Because if you think about it in your everyday uh, conversations with people who aren't in academia, how often do they even describe anything as a, unless they're talking about their work, yeah. right? But if I say you know there's some interesting processes that are operating here, just saying that signals. And what I would normally get is they would go like this: <laughs> What you doing here? Right? Mm -hmm. Who are you? Yeah. So I don't want to flex. Right. I don't want to, I don't, I'm not trying to make you look stupid. I'm not trying to sound smarter than you. I just need to interrupt that script a little bit. Um, so the code switching does that for me. Right. But let me be honest with you. I, you know, I'm from LA. People in LA speak just like this. Yeah. There's this weird assumption that if you're from the hood, that you don't have, you don't have any smart people in the hood. That's not true. Right. You have all kinds of people there. Right, not everybody is talking like like they gang bang. People are from everywhere, mm -hmm. and so I could be my authentic self. I didn't have to. I didn't have to, the code switching wasn't nearly as drastic as one might think. The code switching was just for the deputies. But when I'm back talking to other people, I could just right. be me. Right. I think one of the most startling thing to some people that don't study criminal justice is that we went through a whole era, and perhaps we're still in it, that was colorblind, meaning. There was not the acknowledgement of race and racism and how, in some ways, it is a cultural engine that makes many of these institutions work, hmm. right? So I read that about, about that in courts, but I, you have an amazing section where you just elaborate how there's a racial order hmm. to the everyday life that serves a purpose to the institution. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, you know, I think what's amazing, maybe to the public or students that are just starting this, it feels very self-evident to them. Hmm. And I'm not sure if it's an era thing, well, whereas, you know, when in 2015, mm -hmm. <laughs> they were so young, some of the undergrads, that they're like, oh, I mean, it's always, you know, we've always acknowledged race. And, and I'm thinking, wait a second, I had to explain that deeply for a long period right. of time. And you just kind of magnificently go in there and peel apart the racial order. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about what it is and why did other scholars miss it? I can't. I can't speak to the second question. Yes, you can. Except, except for the fact, I don't want to. <laughs> so you want me to throw somebody on the bus? You um, don't have to name names. I didn't say name. He names names. names. All right. So, uh, well, the first thing is that, you know, it is a unique space to be. I, the funny thing is, I have a lot of cousins and uncles who've been to jail, but none of them had ever spoken to me about what it means to go to jail. Right. My closest family members only know about my experiences through the book. I don't talk about it either, right? I also wasn't telling anybody. I only recently had a conversation with my oldest son about it. Like, this is what was this is what it was like. And even then, he had to read the book to get some details. Mm -hmm. So whatever's not in there is what I don't, I don't, I just don't talk about. Right. So part of it is, so when you get in there, it's brand new. The first thing that you experience is that, you know, so when you're living in free society, you may have friends in particular in LA, you have Mexican friends, you got friends from El Salvador, you've got friends from here and there, wherever else. Now, LA is highly racially segregated, so it is that. So you live in a predominantly black neighborhood, you may never see anybody but other black people. And then every now and again, like one or two Mexican people here and there. If you live in a pre predominantly Mexican neighborhood, you will never almost for sure see no black people, almost no white people at all. And maybe a sprinkle of an Asian here and there, right? And as you sort of drive going you know, uh, west to east, you see fewer and fewer black people until you get back out to like Marina Valley and whatever, like out to Riverside County or like different pockets, right? And so, but you can have friends. And there isn't this total war between blacks and Mexicans on the street. There is that between the gangs, but not everybody gang bangs. So when you go to jail, though, the first thing that I experienced is like, OK, so you go into this, what I call a pre-housing holding cell, and everybody's in the, in the intake there just waiting to be housed permanently. In that holding cell, it doesn't matter what your race or ethnicity is. We're all together. We all, you know, people are sleeping on top of one another. They're sharing food. Somebody says, I don't want my, my skim milk because you're not, you haven't been accustomed yet to, you, you don't realize you have to drink this. So somebody will be like, yo, shoot it over here. I'll drink it. Uh, you pass your cookies to whoever you want. Then you leave that intake holding cell because mm -hmm. you're not going to get permanent. Actually, let me stop for a second. A deputy will call you out 
um, briefly to do a classification interview. They will ask you, do you get along with all races? I don't know what happens when you say no. I assume you get thrown into administrative segregation. So I said, yes. And then <laughs> what they do is they take you to a permanent housing unit, right? And in the permanent housing unit, there you find out that they also classified you by race. You didn't do it. They didn't ask you that. How do you identify? They identified you. And it's kind of basic sort of what do you look like? Are you kind of brown? Then yes, then you're South Sider here, right? You may not have, you have no sense of what a South Sider is, but you will find out. So in there, so everyone's in a housing unit together. If, let's say we're in a, one, one of those places, the, the closed day rooms where there's two man cells. Every deputy will only put you in a cell with somebody who's in the same racial classification that you're in. They determine that. The only group that's kind of free floating a little bit is Asians who are also identified as black, right? Mm -hmm. So you could be Korean, but you're gonna be housed with the blacks, mm -hmm. right? And so you could be indigenous, you're gonna be housed with the Southsiders, the Latinos. You could have a Latino surname and not identify as Latino and you will be housed with the Southsiders. If you are white in any way at all, you will be housed with the woods, simple as that. Then you will find that in every housing unit, there's three of everything. The tables are organized in threes, the phones are organized in threes, the showers are organized in threes. And you realize very quickly, there's an institutional logic here for how this is supposed to be. I didn't set this up, I come into it as it is. So this racial order literally organizes all of what happens in social life. You had just been sharing food with the same person in the pre-housing holding cell. Now you come into the housing, the permanent housing area, and you can't even talk. You can't walk where you want to go. If that's the south side or side, I can't walk that way. To get to the black table, I got to walk this way, right? There's racialized walkways. There's racialized showers. There's, raci there's a racialized time when we can use the clippers. There's a racialized time from where we're going to go to rec time. The only other, but then there's, strangely enough, if we all go to church, they just line us up together, the 10 or 15 people who identify that they want to go, and everybody can be in there crying and holding hands. You can't even touch anybody in the permanent housing unit, but in church, now you can. And strangely enough, the church is just as visible as that room is back there. Mm -hmm. So you walk out of this space into that room, now you can all interact. You walk out of this space into that room, and let's say that room is now where we're going to have visitation, and everybody's able to interact. The rules are so stupid. They make no sense at all. <laughs> But I try to describe what they look like. And if you felt confused, good, because they are confusing. Right. Um, right. But that's the nature, of, the nature of racial logic here. There's no actual real logic here. Right. It's just what the jails are doing. Right. So this might be one of the most um, well-studied rooms I could possibly get you to be <laughs> in, because these folks have all, a lot of them have read your book. So I would love to turn it over to questions, because I know many of the students have some questions. And so if you could, like, maybe make your way to one of the microphones and Oprah style. Oprah, and Oprah style. Oprah style. Um, Good luck standing there. You need somebody to stand all the way up in the, out of the middle of the row. I'm eyeballing. I'm, I'm literally making eye contact with some of my students because I know <laughs> they have some questions. Yes. yes, Alex, thank you for saving us all, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> Hey, my name is Alex. I'm a junior at Brown studying political science sociology. I just wanted to ask, like, when it comes to, like, being in jail, I know a lot of things they do is to strip you of your identity and of like, your personhood, like the beds and the uniforms. But, like, how did you find either you or, like, the people around you trying to, like, reclaim, like, their identity or, like, self-respect? This is interesting. I don't know that... <laughs> This answer might not be satisfying for you, but I'm gonna just tell you what, it, what the experience was for me. I'm often asked about the nature of resistance in jail. So there is what we might academically call resistance, a code as resistance, and then there's what we just, we're just doing. So there's a way that you sort of style your clothing, for example. Is that resistance or is it just sort of, re, is it rec reclaiming your identity or is it just, sort of a holdover of what we would all normally do because fashion is still important to us. It depends on how, what you decide academically this is. I can tell you while we're in there, no one's saying, I, this is my way of resisting against the institution. I'm gonna make sure I cut my hair. That's not how people thought about it. Now, as there was a form of resistance that was very obvious, people would take off their wristbands. I'm not an animal. I'm not gonna wear this wristband. So they find ways to take it off. But your wristband was also access to food, you can't get your stuff from the commissary. You can't get clothing exchanged. So you wear the same underwear for however long until you're willing to put your wristband back on. 
So you subject, now that's real resistance. You do subject yourself to problems if you do that. On the other hand, um, these sort of everyday things that people might do, playing games, creating dominoes out of toilet paper and toothpaste and, um, and uh, pencil lead. And I don't know that I would call it resistance more than I would call it just sort of a, a, not, a, not, not so much against the system, but just as a general way of sort of making sense of the time and getting use of the time. Whether we code it as resistance is kind of up to the person, right? I can tell you, being there, that is not the way that we thought about it. That's not the way we discussed it, right? To the extent that we discussed it at all. Mm -hmm. um, it, felt, it's, it, it feels much more like, I'm here, what am I gonna be doing, mm -hmm. right? Awesome, and we have the, the microphones now floating around. Um, go ahead. Okay. Maybe. So yeah, in your book you talked about penal structure and just like the essence of from the very get-go you're already being dehumanized. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, like even when you talk about your own family members being former and like formerly incarcerated, does that still fall from the very structure of penal penal um, posture to other structures? Like does that still follow you throughout your life and even right now? Mm -hmm. Like do you still feel yourself trying to fight against like the systematic dehumanization that you face in the jail? No, I don't. But that's not everybody. I can't say that for everybody else. You know, I, I said this in the book, but one of my close friends, um, I almost said his name, I, you know, probably want his name mentioned, but um, he says to me, you know, Michael, you haven't gone to jail is like the 17th thing that I think about when I think about you. Mm -hmm. Right. Because my identity is not wrapped up in having been in jail. That's not who I am. That's not how I understand myself. So I don't find myself in this sort of deep conversation about what it once meant to be in jail. It doesn't mean that I don't think about it. I do think about it. And a lot of what I experience, I keep to myself. That's not particularly relevant for everyday conversation. Um, that said, you know, the penal posture, that, that was something I found difficult to, to sort of give up initially when I came home. I still, for a long period of time, would flush the toilet as I was urinating because I was just used to having to do that, right? It's a rule that you have to follow while you're in there, this sort of way of trying to keeping people from feeling some, somehow or another, we had, it had been established that in jail that if, while you're urinating, you should keep flushing the toilet that nobody wants to hear the sound of pee hitting the, uh, the water, but it was better to hear the sound of flushing toilets. I, mean, I just don't, it doesn't matter. But, you know, toilets out here don't work that way. You can't just keep flushing, right? So, but I, there's something that I had to think about that I remember feeling like I need to undo. I also had crazy cravings for some of the foods, like making a jailhouse pizza. I tried to do it. There is the, you can't get the ingredients. And when you tell somebody that you need ramen, grape jelly, <laughs> uh, Doritos, you, you'd love it if I made you one, John. You'd be dying to have one. Your mouth would be watering. Yeah. Um, you look horrible. Look, <laughs> if you tell somebody you need these things, some cheese squeeze and some cardboard eggs, whatever else, they're like, yo. But I missed it. And I was trying to make it. You know what I mean? So those things, but now, not now, right? Now I don't have anything to do with that. Not because it reminds me of jail necessarily, it's because it doesn't even sound appetizing. I don't eat that. But I don't, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's something called a, like a carceral identity. I think it's important to pay, attention to pay attention to the races and the ethnicity of people who will still ascribe to such a thing as a, as a carceral identity. I don't think that's something that black people should do. I don't do it, right? Now, if that's who you are, that's who you are. It's fine, it's not up to me to, to tell you how to present yourself to the world, but that is not how I present myself. So I don't think of myself as having this sort of broader fight. Instead, I am just, a, I'm a scholar. I had this experience. Guess what? I also just play tennis. I also used to work out. I also do a bunch of different things. Um, and all of those experiences do matter for who I am um, to the extent to which one is dominating the other. You know, right now, the most important identity for me is being a father, a black father in particular, followed by being a professor, um, a sociologist, right? I want to explain. I don't, um, and this is not a diss against anybody else who does it differently. They're allowed to. Can I ask one a follow up to that, which is we did this Du Bois conference here and before the pandemic. And I remember we had everybody in the in the room raise their hands if they had links to incarceration, mm. meaning were you incarcerated or were, did you have family, friends, you know, neighbors? And it was basically a, so many scholars of color and almost everybody's hand went up in the in the air. And on the one hand, admitting that kind of normalized it and destigmatized it. On the other hand, we don't want it to be like some kind of this is primary all identity. Yeah. yeah. So how do, is there a way to normalize it without that being the predominant identity? So, because yeah. that to me is important because so many people, especially students that have had family members incarcerated, they wear it like a stigma or a shame, the shame that you, you know, as, and that's, that, that feels like something to be shameful of or embarrassed of, but yet we don't want that. So how, how would students that 
have gone through that think about it this is hard to, to, to tell you how to how to think about your experiences if you've had this so as many people who wear it wear it as a badge of shame there are others who can't wait to say they've done this mm -hmm. right those people are, are more problematic to me there's a, a one of my he's a friend I'm using this term um, sort of loosely here a person I know um, super smart also but um, but a white colleague of mine who I went to grad school with, and he told me, he was like, Mike, Michael, here's what we should do, right? So we should go, we should think about a petty crime we could do, get arrested, then we could write about it, you write about it, what it means from, a, from the black perspective, and I write about it from perspective. Hold on, John, you be all right, man, you're going to <laughs> There are people, in the, my, some of my students are gasping I'll write too, about it so, from the perspective okay. of a white person. Oh my. Well, this is like the whitest suggestion of all time, bro. Like, <laughs> what are we doing here? I would never think to do this. So. He, for him to even suggest it talks much more about what it what he how he understands the experience yeah. so the novelty of yeah it. like this is some cool thing like i went yeah. to camp or something like no nah, bro yeah. this is not what this is also i suspect that what by our saying we could do this crime together and i think what i'm going to get and what you're going to get is not going to be the same thing so yeah you'll come home you'll write this and you probably will be home in three days you and, and bye bye alive. career yeah, yeah i might not survive it so for me, I think you have to be your authentic self. If your authentic self is, this is the most, if you, particularly if you're doing work for like, if you're an abolitionist, or if you're somebody who's formerly incarcerated and now you're doing work for people who are currently or formerly incarcerated, then that identity makes sense right. to me. Right. As uh, Ruben Miller always says to me, he's like, man, sometimes the way back out is back in. This is why people who have been drug addicts oftentimes work in um, it's, you know, organizations that are not trying to help people who are, who are drug abusers, right, who are suffering. So, because you're trying to get out of it, but you're trying to help somebody else, you go back to the place where you're still interacting with those same kinds of people or people mm -hmm. are suffering the same kinds of issues. I understand that. But if you're trying to get some kind of academic chops by saying, you know, street right. cred or something like that, by, by associating yourself with a jail or a prison, you're ridiculous to me. Yeah. You know, you're, you know, you're going to end up, which what's going to happen is you're going to, you're going to try to conduct a study with somebody who's real and you're going to find out the hard way that that ain't going to fly. It's not going to fly. Not me. I don't put hands on nobody. I'm a peaceful brother. <laughs> oh, okay. And then, oh, awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Talking about being your authentic self, mm -hmm. I was just like reflecting on the tone of your book compared to other works we've read. Mm -hmm. And it's much more narrative and emotional, which it's something you talk about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, I was just wondering what led you to make that choice because I assume obviously it was like an intentional thing. Right. So, yeah, I wanted the first thing is I, as I was talking to the class earlier today, I want people to read it. So my very first thought was, what do I need? How do I need to write this so that people will want to read it? This is not a study that I'm ever going to replicate. Right. <laughs> I'm never going to do this again. So. I need to give it all to you in this moment as much as I possibly can, right? Everything that's relevant at least. So thing number one, what will make you want to read it? Thing number two, what do we all complain about? Every sociologist says sociologists can't write, right? So, well then why, stop writing that. Stop writing that way if you think this is an issue. And then thirdly, emotions really are king. It's how I understand the world. So for me, the writing needed to, and I should say along these same lines, the writing needed to reflect my particular style, my flair, my culture, the way that I would say it, the way that I saw other people say it, the way other people speak, the rhythm of my speech, that has to be there. It can't be, you know, anybody could have written this book. It needs to be, you know, if they make a movie about this, it needs to be some, some black man from LA who, that, that person can do this, right? Not just any scholar. So not just any person can play this role because someone needs to have some sense of what it's like. To, I want you to feel me when you're there. So experiences are oftentimes tied to emotions. This is why I write it the way it is, right? Well, you know, I remember a woman I dated because of the way she smelled or because of the sound of her voice, a place that I went to because I remember the color of the trees, or I remember the way it felt when I walked into this place, that it was creepy or that it was loving or whatever it was. I felt something first, and the memory and the understanding and the interpretation of my time there is tied to how I, ex I ex experienced it. The experience is all being wrapped up in emotions. I got to write it that way. Right, so that you get it that way. You should have some type of, um, you should feel a way after you get done writing the, or reading the book. What I'm gonna tell you how you should feel, but you should feel a way. You shouldn't just read it and be like, oh, that was interesting, and then just move on. I want you to feel like, damn, this is something I didn't understand before. Or you should laugh when, this, when the sections are funny, because it was funny to me. 
You should be upset when I was upset. You should feel fearful when I felt fearful. You should feel uncertainty because I felt uncertainty. Not just me, but everybody else who was there. You should feel anger because a lot of us did. You should feel happy because sometimes we were happy. You should feel, you know, what it's like. You should be able to imagine what it's like to have a, a spread of food and we're all eating it together. Something that is hard for me to imagine doing now as a complete germaphobe, but I suffered through. Uh, <laughs> I was hungry. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask. So there are a lot of examples, whether it was like with like the rep system mm -hmm. or like uh, deputies essentially forcing people to miss court time and getting FTA charges. Yeah. But there were a lot of. It seemed like there were so many instances throughout the entire process where sort of your fate was unilaterally controlled by people other than yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how, um, like how that like psychologically impacted you and um, the other folks in the jail. And then also just like how, how you guys sort of acted in ways that reclaimed your sense of like independence and control over your situation. Mm -hmm. So here's one sort of example of that. So you're right. So the, a lot of what you're doing, I mean, if you're incarcerated, so your time is not your own. Your behavior, you know, what you want to do is not up to you. So you may want to, I remember that. So there's a rule about uh, not being allowed to flush the toilet when someone's eating. And so and particularly when, if you're from a different, you know, opposing racial groups, but you're in a small room, right? I'm in a, what I would call an open day room, dormitory style. And I remember sitting at a table and a guy I called baby joker or something because there's a lot of baby jokers in there. <laughs> I called him, I think I called him baby joker. He flushed the toilet. He didn't know that I was sitting at the table. He just didn't notice me. Or I don't know what he was doing, but he flushed the toilet. And I remember groaning like, ugh, right? I wasn't going to do anything. I didn't want no problems with the Southsiders. No black person did. None of us wanted any problem. We, we were far outnumbered, so we didn't want any beef. But just saying that, someone else from another Southsiders looks at me and then checks him. So you can't even go to the restroom when you want to, right? It's not up to you. You don't have control over that. When you... When, I want to, here's when I want to go, right? You can't just go when you want to. What you do at some point is you establish rules for how these things are going to play out, right? So one of the rules is, all right, here's when you're allowed to go to the restroom, right? And so you just operate within that. That's really not different from what we do in everyday society. You can't just do whatever you want whenever you want to, even now. We like to think of, I, I'm, I'm saying that because I don't want to fetishize the jail. Like, yeah, there's rules. There's always social rules, always, right? The idea that it's somehow unique in jail is just a farce. It's a, it's, a, it's a false lead if you start looking for that. Instead, look for what's more common. There are rules here in society. There's rules there in, in that society as well. So how do you work with, what do you do with those rules? You work within the confines of them. Now, the ones you find to be debilitating or overly stressful, you fight to the extent that you can, right? So for example, there's rules about when, when you can show up, when you can get your clothing and what clothing you, you can and won't, uh, will and won't wear. The socks are the socks. They're going to be holes in them. The, 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 the boxers are going to be stained with God knows what, right? The t-shirts are going to look the way they look. All the clothes are going to... So some people, what you, you learn to do is you develop a friend who's working and sort of working that bin, and you try to get that person to put a pair of boxers to the side for you. Is that It's not exactly resistance, but it's your way of sort of getting around the issue of, I don't want to wear some soiled boxers, right? That doesn't work 100% of the time, though. You understand that. So it just is what it is. We do that same thing now. Somebody will come in here and save you a seat. This is where I want to sit. Save me a seat. Or this is, you know, yo, get me. And when I was in high school, yo, give me an extra chocolate milk, right? Like some, this is so normal. I'm just, that's my point. Like, it's so normal that we do it everywhere. When I'm doing any kind of research, I try to focus on all of that. Like, what is common across these different social contexts? Mm -hmm. And I think we have at least one more or two more. I think that's all we have time for. And then we're going to do a, a book signing, I'm, I'm assuming, over there, right? Yes or no? OK. But yeah. Go ahead, Sam. And then. I hear you. Yeah. All right. There we go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk. Uh, so as we were talking about with, in this narrative, you have very intentionally inserted your field notes from mm -hmm. of the experiences of others right alongside the your you know your what we could call your field notes of your own experience mm -hmm. and you know you said exercise you used it to exercise your demons but you know in a lot of ways it is it's also data and it's also something that you find incredibly relevant to study of 
of the jail. Right. Um, and I think in sociology as a field, we do have this understanding uh, that emotions do matter. And I think we are coming around to that more often, that the subjective and the objective aren't quite as separate as we pretend that they mm -hmm. are, uh, particularly the, object, the supposed objectivity of the researcher. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a long uh, preface. This um, is academia. This is what we all do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Sam's destined for a PhD. <laughs> That's what's going on right now. Um, where do you think that that fits in, or should fit in, in the broader field of sociology, or where does that, where has that fit in in your in your research and work? And I know this is a new book, but mm -hmm. you know, in your research and work after this book. Mm -hmm. So there, it's not new for somebody to write from the perspective of deep emotionality. Feminist scholars have been doing that for a long time. Black scholars, in general, have been doing that for a very long time. Whatever we, I guess when we say mainstream sociology, we just mean like predominantly white, white sociologists. They're going to write how they write. It's not up to me to make them write any kind of way. Um, you know, I think about Ruben Miller's book. It's written like jazz, is what I always tell them. It's like reading this is like listening to jazz music. Mm -hmm. When you read, I, I have my own playlist from what I'm writing. And Nicole has her own playlist for what she's writing. John has his own that we all have. So we are all we have to be able to write from the style that makes us who we are. So I just didn't avoid that. I took a risk because no one told me I could or could not do this. But because no one said that, I'm going to do it the way I want to. I had Oxford had already said, we'll write, we'll publish the book. So it doesn't it almost doesn't matter. I'm going to write it the way I want to now. And I had a, I had somebody who was supporting me. So for me, emotions have to be at the center of what you're doing if what you're trying to do is explain why social behavior looks the way it does. You've got to think about structure and emotions. Those two things always work together. Um, so all I'm doing is just doing my, my due diligence as a good sociologist. Mm -hmm. I think everyone really should, though. Yeah. One more, last question. Is that Hello. Oh, Thank you for um, speaking. And, um... My name is Michael Thompson. I'm a first year MPH student, Master of Public Health, focusing on health services. And while you was like talking, you said something about like not having like treatment, mm. and like it kind of like rung a, like a bell in my head. So like being in like being incarcerated, and you know having like a mental breakdown, and I know they throw you in like solitary like solitary confinement, and to keep yeah. like like in a hole or something. Yeah. What are they doing to like? What were they doing to like help those, like people? Those... You know the answer to this question, bro. I know, but I'm just saying though, like, like, <laughs> like, are they like giving them like, like, what, like, what, like, what are they doing to like improve? Like, I know, like, don't you know the answer to that question too, bro. I know the question, <laughs> but I'm just saying though, like, if you go into if if they throw you in a hole, it's not it's a it's a higher chance that you're gonna do the same thing again. So Absolutely. I'm trying to see like what are they doing in there to like adapt like good measures so they won't end up going back into the hole. Like, Cause I know if I'm in, if I'm in a, an area that's dark, I'm there for 30 days, my mind is like going crazy. So like, what are they doing in there? I think it's actually legal to be in there for that long. That doesn't mean well, you won't yeah, be, but yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so, well, nothing, Yeah. absolutely nothing. Nothing before you go in, nothing while you're in, nothing when you come out, nothing. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to understand if they're not trying to help you, they're not trying to improve your life. There's no such thing as rehabilitation in a jail. Mm -hmm. This is a place where you go to be punished. You here because they think you deserve to be here. Whether you deserve to be here or not, doesn't even matter. That's it's outside of the question. You're here, you're gonna get as much punishment as we can heap upon you. It's gonna look however it looks. Part of the why the reason I write the book the way that I do is because I want you to see that it's completely arbitrary. It doesn't matter what you what charge ward. I mean, charge ward whatever you want to be. It doesn't even matter. You're all gonna get gonna get punished here. Pain. That's what we're here to give you. It reminds me of this movie Hellraiser from back in the 80s, right? What's your pleasure, son? Pain. That's what you're here for. Right? You're not gonna be so there is no treatment. When I was in the um, in that safety cell and I had the, the 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 three women come visit me, the first one just reads questions at me. The second one comes like in sort of an like an auntie type of kind of feel. She's like, all you gotta do is say this and you'll get out. And then the doctor comes and he's like, you want to get out? Yes. Thank you. That was it. There's no treatment. There's no follow up. Right. What happened to you, Michael? You were there. Now what do we do? There's no there's not even a record that I was there. Right. When I go see mental health later on in the same jail, they don't know that that's what I experienced. 
right? So these types of things, there's no such thing as treatment here. When we, people say mental health is occurring in jails, it's not, mm -hmm. right? There is a mental health place in the jail. This would be like having a financial aid department that doesn't give you financial aid, right? That's what this is, mm -hmm. right? Or you've gone to maybe you've uh, unfortunately surely not here at Brown University, but someplace else you may you've heard of students who've gone to classes and the teachers or instructors don't know anything. They're not helping you. They're not they won't, won't you know no kind of instruction, no support. You have to think of the jail as what it actually is. This is a place to harm you. That's what's going to happen when you get there. If you survive it, you survive it. But you don't survive it and you know come out better. This is why I use the term endure. That's all you're trying to do. You're not trying to thrive. You don't adapt. You don't become better. You don't become better suited. You just survive. Thank you so much for oh, this yeah. discussion. Thank you. thank you for this amazing book. And thank you all for coming. Dr. Walker will be signing books. Maybe you should just stay here and people can kind of come <laughs> up and bravo. Thank you. Thank you.